Hello everyone, this is Victor Dantas here from the Zero to Hero Academy. Uh, over the years, we have helped multiple professionals uh, either get into the power platform market or some of the seasoned professionals within the industry up their game within the low code technologies. And we are here to announce that we have a special program coming up between March 19th and May 30th. This is the Power Pages and AI Zero to Hero Mentorship Program. Join us, click on the link, access the lessons, you know how we do it, live lessons on Teams, and then the recorder goes up to YouTube and you can follow if you are in different time zones, but you pref we prefer it to join it live. Connect, ask questions, so go ahead, invite your colleagues, your dad, your mom, your grandpa, let's everybody join the fun, all right? We'll see you then, take care. I guess this is pretty much our last lesson for the uh, Zero to Hero program. I mean, with actually some some subject. I'm I'm still gonna do one next Tuesday to conclude the series. We're gonna have a look at uh, what was taught, uh, what was presented, and what are the plans for for the next mentorship. But essentially, we have saved the best for last. I mean, Nikita and I, we met, uh, I think it was be beginning of uh, April um, in Florida. Uh, by the way, that location was nice, Nikita. That uh, was a great suggestion. Uh, anyhow, and uh, he kindly offered his time to present in, the, in this mentorship. And uh, I think Nikita has an angle of the product that maybe none of us have uh, coming uh, from someone that works at Microsoft who can actually uh, look at the way things are done from the back end. So I'm, I'm anxious to, to see what he's going to present. Of course, the title of the, the lesson itself is already, <laughs> it's already awesome. So Nikita, the floor is yours. Thank you for, for your time today. Hey, thank you. So, um, uh, likewise, Victor, it was great to uh, to to see you and catch up in person. And uh, uh, it's been really good to uh, see all the excitement and Zero to Hero program go on. So, um, one of the things that I want to do today is uh, just kind of have a conversation. In fact, uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something that maybe sounds scary. I didn't have a deck 15 minutes ago. I just had a list of items I wanted to talk about, and some of it will have demos, and some of it I'll actually have a presentation for. Because um, I just wanted to kind of toss out a couple top of mind things that I have. So give me just a second. Uh, no, that, that's awesome, Nikita. I'm I'm so grateful for uh, um, airline Wi-Fi because it saves me every time. Uh, I, I, I have some of these decks ready to present, but because of the velocity that things are changing, uh, a lot of times I'm reviewing decks and adding things and completely transforming a presentation last minute. So I'm, I'm glad that some of these uh, airlines, they, they now have good Wi-Fi services. And it, it does come to, uh, to the rescue. Uh, it has. For the last few conferences I, I presented, so I, I understand. But uh, we have a we have a saying in in Brazil that uh, whomever knows the topic is able to present live without any particular uh, uh, lead time. So yeah, you, you you know your stuff. I'm sure this session is going to be amazing. Thank you. And I got a I got a child at home and I got a dog here who's in the uh, who's in the cage. So uh, there shall be definitely an interruption of somebody walking in at some point and uh, <laughs> um, uh, we'll see how it goes. So the, the re um, really quick about ourselves. So um, and thank you for those watching us uh, um, uh, later in the recording. So uh, who who is uh, who am I and, and what team do I work on? So I work on a team called uh, PowerCat, right? So um, that's the shirt and and the brand that I'm really 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 fortunate to be uh, part of the Microsoft organization and part of our customer experience and customer and partner success team. Um, you know, CX CPS just smooth and, and rolls off the tongue. But what our goal is is we're part of engineering. And being part of engineering, our focus is in our little group 
in the operational side is actually to be the bridge between the engineering team and customers. Now we work with just a few customers a year because as literally as you can see in this slide, you know, dedicated to Power Pages is uh, uh, Stu Solution Architects, myself and Donovan Good. And then we have Phil Topnas uh, of the PowerCat Live fame. Uh, they're kind of managing us uh, and a few other programs like Kickstarter um, and, and other things. And there's a bigger team in Power Apps that is um, uh, uh, in the Power Cat that works with, let's say, uh, Power Apps and Power Automate, um, I guess, Copilot Studio, and so forth, and uh, and and typically we're kind of get aligned to our um, um, top purchasers over products uh, because we're a no charge kind of a team. But we also go and engage with community, right? So while we can't typically probably work with most of our customers statistically, right? We probably work with one percent of our customers. We engage and run things like Power Champions community. Uh, advisory boards and other things uh, that broaden that spectrum and engage with more. Um, also, a lot of our team is really people who are um, just fanatics of what we do. Uh, so myself and Donovan, you know, we we both worked on on projects with ADX Studio when we got started. So right as that got acquired by uh, um, uh, by Mike before it even got acquired by Microsoft, we both have like uh, you know Donovan has like actual engineering background. I'm kind of a self-taught uh, programmer and was worked as a .NET developer. Found Dynamics by building a custom portal. So my history with this product is actually I built an ESP.NET portal for Dynamics, I think 2003 uh, or 2004 version. So, you know, I wanted to get, start to get a little nice. Um, and I decided to make that my career and uh, went over to the dynamics practice actually, because I got to spend more time with customers in a more consultative role rather than getting a work item in uh, TFS. So I quit development, went to CRM, and then as soon as I did, ADX, we actually uh, worked for a company called Tribage. They hired ADX to do to come in um, you know, because they signed up to be a partner and they had a five day training, which I feel like minimum for power pages training is five days, really. Like you need to really get immersed and embedded. Um, um, so the total content length, right? Um, so this is really cool why, um, uh, you know, uh, the zero to hero program exists. You got so much curriculum and I'm so proud that this product now has so many ways, uh, that you can go online, you can go on YouTube, you can go find, um, uh, uh videos and there's, People are offering courses and custom training programs uh, left and right. So very, very, very proud to see the product. So today, kind of based on some of our experience, this is kind of loosely scripted, right? There's definitely a few things that I wouldn't say it's like, I, I didn't spend too much time saying that, what are the top 10 things? But I'm going to show you top common things that are common kind of stumbling blocks. And then I'll give you um, a couple of security tips and perf tips that are very, very common. Uh, one of the things we started to do is uh, on our team is when a larger customer sometimes run into problems and they kind of need to uh, kind of escalating out through Microsoft. Basically, we don't see fun projects sometimes, right? We we see our managed customers that we get to fortunate to work with. We you know our, our job is to make sure they end up in a happy place with the product, and most customers do. But because of the unique position that we're able to do, I've got a chance to probably see hundreds and. Uh, probably definitely over a hundred kind of projects that had issues or questions, right? Like escalations come to me um, when I was in Fast Track or when I was in um, the, the PowerCat team. So I have a very unique and unfair position of actually seeing and fixing challenges, right? So let's talk about a few things and uh, um, um, get right in. So the time is not on our side. So first of all, uh, and I can actually call this session Get Started. So if you ever worked on a project or you worked at a customer and you've seen this screen, and it, for the first time, if you're a beginner, this screen is amazing. And this experience actually, uh, as you finish through it, actually forces you to create a site. So if you're a user and another user invited you because they created the site to work on a project, now you're kind of in this place where this used to force you to create a site. Now it no longer does. But what we're overtrained ourselves to do is probably like, oh, the studio link, you know, if I'm working on a project with Victor and Victor created a site and I log in to the same tenant and I have rights in that environment and I select the same environment, unlike this screenshot where they selected Contoso default environment, I would even, let's say, uh, select like, you know, um, 
I don't know, some, some project's dev environment. And I select it and I still get stuck on this welcome page. And you'll get stuck on this welcome page until you create at least one site in this tenant. There's two challenges. You might not have rights to create a site in the tenant for various reasons, like Azure AD rights, for example, is one of the reasons that you might not have rights. Um, uh, cause you actually, uh, your account needs to have rights to provision an Azure Active Directory app registration. Um, so right now, if you don't have that right, you will fail in your ability to create a site. So the team behind this actually got smart and actually over the last year, cut up to a lot of those exceptions. So as you actually get started, the one thing that didn't go away is the get started screen itself. So you still need to hit get started. If you don't have rights to create a site, you'll see a different experience. So you hit get started select your industry, and then on the next page, if you have rights to create a site, it will kind of push you to maybe use the Copilot to create a site. Pick one of the templates or you know um, do something. And then on the bottom, I don't have a, a handy screenshot, it'll say edit existing site. And the moment you click that, you're going to see what you probably expect to see. And let me uh, click and get to my uh, uh, demo experience real quick. Right, you're going to see this. Because what you're trying to do is get to the screen. And once you kind of hit get started and finish through that first set, uh, it's not going to bog you anymore. If it does, again, you can just click, you know, get started um, and then hit edit an existing site, right? So that's my first tip um, is because by now you're kind of, if you're joining projects, especially if you're a consultant uh, and you're in your customer tenant developing and working on those solutions, you're going to be in that place where uh, uh, you're probably going to be like, oh, okay, let me get the URL. Uh, Victor, can you edit the studio and send me the URL and that open it? Because you can actually skip right past it by doing that. You don't need to anymore. Right. Now I'm going to just kind of jump through in, in the getting started, right? I showed this earlier in my team introduction slide, right? Like, so just like myself, when I was in a partner channel delivering solutions or as customers were, customers or partners could both buy EDX Studio portals. Um, it was a, Third-party product, you paid the license. I don't remember, I don't remember the license model, but uh, it, it usually worked out pretty good. Uh, it was basically an accelerator. It was an ASP.NET project that you got. You got a key, activation key, into this thing, and you got a bunch of pre-built libraries, but ASP.NET code, and you build stuff. And um, that was a third party, obviously, like an ISV. What happened around 2016 is that Microsoft purchased it to augment its Dynamics 365 suite of products and services and called it Dynamics 365 portals. Then around the low-code revolution, right, like when we took Dataverse and ripped it out of Dynamics 365 because we were able to prove that we can host multi-terabyte, right, heavy global organizations could run on this solution. So why invent uh, um, that engine will take Dataverse out of Dynamics, and then hey, this portals technology. You keep seeing customers, uh, you know, buy just a little bit of Dynamics and, and buy the the Dynamics 365 portals license and use portals to solve their customer needs. So as that happened, uh, we saw them create Power Apps portals as well. So we extracted Power Apps portals and Dataverse. So you don't have to buy Dynamics and Dynamics 365 portals just to work on that project. So that was pretty cool. But that introduced a new product name, Power Apps Portals. And in fact, the technical name actually had a lowercase p. Um, so in, then in 2022, we launched Power Pages, and except it was actually Power Portals, but I'm sure there was like somewhere in one of the 122 countries Microsoft operates in, somebody has a trademark for Power Portal. So we could not call Power Pages Power Portal. Uh, but not so bad. I think I've, I've, I've grown to love and like it. Um, and why, why did I spend all this time on it? Well, because frankly, the technology and the expertise, and um, if you were blindly somehow were like sent back in time, set through the ADX Studio course and were flashed back forward um, beyond few things, like obviously all the co-pilot experiences that are now um, web API and the beautiful editor called the Power Pages Studio, you would still have a really good, healthy foundation of what to build. What I'm trying to say also is, if you're new to this product and you don't have a time machine, you can still use the old product names to use the benefit of the online search engines to give you the answers. Now, we've renamed a few things you know, a little bit since, since we're here, but the good news is Pages has been growing so much, even I myself bravely go to the search engine and type in Power Pages, and we'll talk about couple things that are going to be uh, fundamental, like uh, login page customization, profile page customization. There's articles and blog that address that, right? 
um, since we're already two years since this brand launched. But let's say you're looking for something really particular, right? Um, are forms in grids. One was called entity list and entity form. So if you're ever looking for questions on specific things, let's say around form metadata or um, you know a common problem or a challenge, just adjust your search engine from power pages and then typing in your problem to power app portals in your problem. Or then, or if you're really into the weeds of something and you still haven't found something, dynamics portals, right? And then your problem, and you can find the answer. So just uh, just a little just a little pro tip, um, and you would be surprised and uh, 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 shocked sometimes. Like in my day job, people are like, "Hey, uh, how do I do this?" I go type it in, and most of the times, like if I need to get to like Power Pages, a lot is a good question. And people are like, does it exist? What do I use? And I'm like, hmm, let me see. Power Pages ALM, first hit. <laughs> and I send them that page, right? It actually describes our options, right? And it describes the enterprise ALM option that we actually had uh, for uh, about three years now that enterprise customers use. So what we now have for ALM is the Power Pages uh, being, becomes able to add it to a solution. That's new alternative to an existing three uh, plus year uh, feature using Power Platform command line interface to import and export solutions. Not solutions, sorry, the, the, the Power Pages across environments. So that exists. So let's um, let's do this. So the first topic is, it's uh, it's less about how to get started. We're gonna, I'm going to talk about something uh, maybe as a teachable lesson um, is our editors. And with the history, right, I want to jump into this thing, right? Power Pages has basically editors and where its configuration sits and the actual runtime that runs it. So let me actually kill my video because I don't know how in the post-production that it's going to overlay. So let me just do that. Okay. So, and, and I put this together when, when it just started to kind of come out, right? So the Power Apps um, portal, Dynamics 365 portal. When Dynamics 365 portal came out, this portal management app was really the only way to manage it. In fact, in EDX Studios, this was the only thing that you could do is you have this model-driven application to edit your solution. So here's what it looked like, right? It's this thing, right? And we had this thing for a while. So if you needed to go change page content, right, on your website, right, if you go to root pages, you know, look and feel changed and evolved over the years. This has you know more to do with the model-driven app infrastructure. See, there's like new look enabled, but editing content and working with code or doing all of the settings and tweaks lives here, and it lives here. And you can edit, and this is where the content lives. It doesn't live in this app. It lives in in rows and tables in Dataverse. Now, enhanced data model kind of kicks it up a notch. Is there used to be like 12 or so Dataverse tables, which is actually partially why it almost took an hour to install us because um, it takes a lot of relationships and tables it's installing in Dataverse as a solution before it even gets deployed. Enhanced data model said, hey, let's take these 12 tables and make them three, site, site component, and I think site language, right? So now 12 tables got smashed into one site component. We built virtual tables around it, but in essence, the same thing, in fact, Portal management and there's pages management tool, same thing. On the left side, you navigate and get to everything. But what's a model driven app? Model driven app is the form and view representation on top of a Dataverse table, which means the actual source of truth for the configuration of the site lives in the table. So I have a point here I'm going to get to. So you can edit the code sitting in Dataverse using Portal Management App. This is kind of the classic, the original. Then Power Apps Portals came by. They had a studio. You can't get to it anymore. There's like no geography. You can log into this thing anymore. This was our first iteration of kind of what you see, what you get. We went to the Power Apps team and from Dynamics 365 Portals team, Power Apps is all about you know makers and ease of use. So they said, hey, we're going to need a studio. Fantastic. So a richer editor that came by. When Power Pages was being rebuilt, they built a new studio, way better from scratch. Um, you know, is multi-language ready, so we could be in all the languages uh, that uh, uh, it's available. They're talking about the maker experience, right? And using more modern tools, things like that. They've rebuilt that. 
They've also built a bunch of new solution templates, even though they're not editors, they're actually templates. So they built like basic template, they did like program registration, but these are just new look and feel, but the look and feel is in the actual templates. The code is stored in the same tables for eight years, right? Until we went to the new enhanced data model, but same thing, it's still laid out exactly the same way. So you also have this awesome new online editor called Visual Studio Code .dev. Right, that's the online IDE, which is really awesome. That's literally there's like some magic voodoo happening here. What it's able to do is it's able to take your code, right? It actually technically sits here, right? So if we go to let's go to my uh, web templates. Web templates, right? And I have my uh, header template. And a few of them I need to make sure I'm in the right language, but I'm just going to open one. Um, one of these is going to be the right one. There we go. So this code and the code that I can go and edit in the studio. Right. So in the studio, the home page, the ability to edit this page here, and an ability to edit this page. I'm just going to open this. In here, it's actually the same page. So there, the reason why I'm spending a little bit of time on this is that there could be a little bit of a problem here. So one, I'll actually, we won't have time because we're going to run out of time to expand on this. But the concept of ALM, folks expect that as I'm editing this thing, somewhere something is keeping history of this or doing some kind of magical source control. And this is my first kind of tip and kind of hopefully you're, you're, you're realizing this. There is nothing watching out for you as you're across here. Now, two things are happening. Um, it's not going to be shown here. But if I had another user in this tenant right now signed in, there is co-presence. So if I'm on this homepage and changing this text, right? And what does it say right now? Like brewing perfection, right? And somebody is working here, right? We, all three of us, can probably change that. So we're going to talk about the preview and sync button. But it's also important to realize that if you truly want enterprise grade application lifecycle management, you will need to potentially segment your users. Now, we gave you a lot of features for you at your own risk to still have multiple developers in one environment. Just be aware of one thing. We don't have versioning. Now, you can enable auditing on the tables, maybe. But as you probably know, there's no rollback when you do that. Now, Studio has an undo stack. So in the Studio itself, because it's its own editor, if I make this change, there's actually a little undo button. You probably even missed that it's here. It's If I go to another section, at some point it gets destroyed, right? So there's three explanation marks that I've added here. I can undo this change and it undoes it. But see how it did the save? So if you're ever an actual user of a model-driven app, this is a model-driven app, you also remember that this thing has an autosave too. So I'm gonna get out of uh, this one page and I'm gonna say, Five exclamation mark. I'm gonna actually let's do this. Uh, I'm gonna call it PMM for portal management app or conveniently pages management app. Both of them are the same. So if I make this change, mouse over this, there's probably an auto save eventually that's gonna come and hit me here. Funny thing is, this is actually the source of truth because this is actually sits right on the metal right at the dataverse. So hmm, don't see this change here. But we all know nobody cares about this change. What we all care about is the actual change on the site. So the first time you're probably working in this environment, you're gonna hit preview button. Man, Nikita, what are you showing me? Like, I know all this. Well, you ever work on things and you're like, where are my changes? So I showed you, you can make a change here, PMA. I can make a change here. I'm gonna call it VS Code. Now, one thing that's different about this environment, I'll come back in just a second, is that see how there's like a little dot and there's a dot on the browser? It's telling me that it didn't finish saving. It doesn't have an autosave, but this does. So we've changed the code here. Okay. It's called PMA. 
We are seeing the actual site. And if you're ever presenting in Teams and you can't get over to your tab because the Teams menu is here, what do you do? Other than panicking or scrolling down, control tab, control tab, control tab. Okay. So we've made that change, but it hasn't reflected. It actually took a little bit. You've noticed that as I was talking kind of a little bit at the same time, you noticed that that change came in here. Why did that change take so long? And why isn't this change still in the studio? Well, the studio is its own editor and it's not reading it real time. In fact, I haven't moved on from this page. So if I go back here, come back here again, I still don't see the change. This is the time where actually hitting sync makes sense. And the sync, what it actually does, it reads the configuration from Dataverse, its source of truth, and shows me that on the screen. So now let's see if the, uh, okay, good. Um, we see the change from PMA. So again, I can go here and actually say, no, studio, right? And click out of it and see, there's like no save button. It's saving it by itself. But what if I go back here and say, VS Code is the best? And I hit Control S. Now, the only thing here that's actually pretty nice is uh, you get a little bit of, uh, hey, there is a there's a problem. Because as it tried to save, because this is an actual IDE, it's saying, hey, since you changed the code and tried saving it now, I have a very different version of this file now in it. Now, the really cool thing about VS Code is that it lays out things like a file system. So it's got a little bit of magic to translate this. Uh, but it's actually able to do the difference. So it's probably not a good demo. See, it sees the difference, right? Studio and VS Code. And I have to pick which one is best. But this is actually just a local file overwrite. There's no ALM version control. Like when I hit this um, and say, this is what I want. Like there's no history or something saved. There's no like Nikita chose this overwrite. It's just what it is now. VS Code is the best. So if I go here. I refresh, portal management app, I scroll down, it says VS Code is the best. Talk about why that's probably not refreshed yet. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. I see sometimes that it took a little bit to refresh, but I'll show you. This is still not, right? I might be browsing around, I'm going around here. So let me wrap up this uh, this this long soapbox. What, what I really want you to do, is it just be aware when you have the studio open, the reason to use sync is if you made changes elsewhere, right? So the benefit of that is previewing it here. But we also know that the real place to look is the actual site, right? When I work on the site, right? So sync is important there. If I'm making changes and while we gave you a beautiful data workspace, one thing I want you to take a notice is this button right here. Set solution. Please set your solution. What if you plan to use view and form configurator, build tables or do what have you, because what happens when you build a table in a default solution? What's your prefix? Not the one you expected, right? So if you didn't set the solution, just set it on default. You do a new table, your table prefix is yuck. Why is that important? Uh, go to your search engine and type in Dataverse Solutions and start learning. Okay, so if you needed to set up a relationship in security, one thing I urge you to do, we'll talk about this again in security, is learn the Power Pages security model. It's critical you do. But as you're working on creating tables and relationship between tables and you're setting up this, many times, frankly, I use Studio uh, a lot also for table permission design. If I created that relationship in uh, make that Power Apps, right? Because I'm using maybe the solution experience there and I've made relationships between tables, added a new column, new table. This is another good reason to hit sync. That way I can see the latest column or relationship. So what's the what's the difference between sync and preview Nikita? Well, very important difference. Sync refreshes the studio. Despite of whatever this text on the bottom says, the only thing it refreshes is the studio, right? So when I make a change, let's get rid of VS Code is the best and just say brief, rude, 
we'll just say best perfection. And we hit control S. If I go here and hit refresh really quick, um, it will not always refresh the configuration cache from my site. And we're about to get into cache discussion. So there's two things that are being cached on, on, on the board, your configuration and the data. Your developer inner loop, as you make changes and work on code, right, should be, I made a change, let's say in Visual Studio Code, I hit preview. There's this animation happening when you hit preview. See that little circle? Dude, I'll keep doing it. What's happening when you hit preview is that we're calling the web app that's running the site and telling it to clear its configuration cache. It's very important you know this. Okay, so go back to here. So just to refresh again, the runtime, the actual site that's running is reading its configuration about what to show, right? Like and and what to render from Dataverse, but it can't do it every single page load because it takes a little bit. In fact, actually, this is why in development, back to this in just a second, as you're developing the site and you're showing this project to somebody, you might have a poor experience. Don't show your project from the development experience, especially when the team is still working on the site. One, it's just bad idea. Two, because um, as you do so, if you make changes in data version publishing, right? You ever hit publish and try to browse uh, model driven app at the same time or dynamics, right? Publish is the uh, is the schema compile on uh, on Dataverse. That takes a long time, right? Um, same thing here. If I'm making changes, note that um, yeah, let me just do it now, right? I made a change. I saved. I'm gonna hit preview. I'm go to this page. This first page reload is gonna take me a really long time compared to one once it's already been kind of rendered. So it's a lot faster. So don't do demos out of dev environment or tell your team to get out of the dev environment um, uh, when you do demos. So hit the preview button e no matter where you're making your changes, right? Sometimes even if I'm working on um, a form and I'm making changes on the form and I'm in like make that power app and I'm in the form editor changing which fields there or the view and I'm hitting save and publish, Save and publish. Then I go to the studio, hit preview, go back here, and I'm signed in. And um, you'll see the change immediately. You don't need to hit the uh, uh, preview desktop part. This just opens you another tab to just that page. Um, you might not care about that page itself, for example. So if we're here deep down in our project, by the way, take power pages in a day, AKMS, power pages in a day as a long one word, you'll learn how to build this um, uh, beautiful website. So in here, if I was making schema changes and working on this, um, as I make my changes, I keep this page open. No matter how I've worked on it, so machine orders in the page copy, uh, you know, whatever the change might be, I hit preview. Right, so functions on the grid. So let me change it from saying grid to saying list. Right, control S, back to the studio, hit preview, let that finish loading, come back here, hit refresh, and this board grid is going to become list. It takes a little bit to load. That's how I almost know for sure that I'm getting a fresh copy done. Scene. Okay, now to preach on the ALM story, once I finished making the changes that I need to make, then I should probably use GitHub or EDO, Azure DevOps Online, to then pull from this environment. I would check in my changes against source control, and then your actual pipeline that you've built, not Power Platform pipeline, the ADO pipeline that you've built with merging and branching and whatever else you've set up there should take on, and you should watch the, um, uh, what you've done in a dev integration environment. You now checked in your actual code towards a work item and do that. And it becomes a little harder to do all of that because uh, you'll have to then remove all these other changes. So if Nikita was working on machine orders and you're working on a home page, I don't want to take your changes yet with my change set of fixing a bug in the machine orders. That, my friends, is ALM and DevOps. It has nothing to do with Power Pages. It has to do with uh, if those concepts are new, you do spend some time scaling up on, frankly, source control and DevOps and CI/CD, and to uh, what tools are available for that is Power Pages 
A11. You type that in, and it's the first hit. And you take a read on this, right? We have build tools for ADO and GitHub actions. Could you use pipelines to move the whole site from one place to another? Sure. Typically, if you're the only dev on that site, or you really good, really careful coordinating that work. But many times people are like, hey, Power Pages doesn't have enterprise grade ALM. It does. It's just not all inside of Power Pages. You're going to need to take this, Axiali, GitHub or ADO, build your own pipeline, and be source control first. Then very likely get to such a good rigor with, with ALM, because there's ALM for you to also on solutions and cloud flows and uh, other components of your solution, you should be able to spin up a dev instance when you begin working on a task. ADO will install everything on the project. You'll work on your task. You check in just your changes to a source code branch, and then that gets moved forward into the source code process. That is the utopia of ALM. So if you want all of the benefits of ALM, you actually got to go full, full bleed into that. Uh, could you do it with solutions? You could. Um, solutions, uh, the only gap there right now is if you unpack a solution, um, your code changes don't look this nice and browsing for them doesn't look this nice. It basically is a big XML blob um, per object um, and it won't be this nicely formatted. It'll just say value and it'll just be long blob. Yuck. So uh, figuring out who broke what on the home page will get really hard when you're looking at um, unpacked version of the power pages inside of solutions. So we burnt a ton of time on that. So um, I'm going to pause and go to uh, other subjects, which is portal cache. So portal cache is actually a separate presentation. So we touched about the configuration cache, which is kind of still very important. But let's talk about other cache. So I'm going to go through a deck, and I've used this deck internally to explain it. And it's probably going to say portals cache quite a bit. So the reason why cache is important is because, and see, it's still got power up portals in places of it, is because power up portals, its runtime, right, has no storage of its own, right, including the actual definition of what's in the site. So in fact, all its configuration and, and actual configuration, like from site settings, is stored in Dataverse. So we can't just keep going back to Dataverse as well. Now, there's one thing to keep in mind. So we talked about configuration cache and hitting preview and sync quite a bit. One of the things you want to make sure you pay attention to is also data cache. So if you ever worked on changes in the data, let's talk about this. So because we don't have an intermediate data, when you, let's say, create a case on, on the portal, that is a real-time transaction. Um, now we do store it. So let's take a look at the scenario of uh, what we have is basically a repeat read cache. So let's say you created a case and then you go back to a list of cases, your case is there. Um, or you navigate to a site and you ask for a list of cases. You logged in, you went there. Um, we're going to go to our data engine and, and take your query with all of your web roles and table permissions and then run it by Dataverse. And then as we come back, we're going to store then i'll show tell you what we store that and then we we show it if the user hits the f5 the browser refresh button right we store the cache for that user for a period of time until that cache is expired and then the next time the user refreshes the list of cases you'd see uh, uh that we don't have that data in the store and then we pull you the new one hmm. so the timeline for when this is happening, right? I mean, typically you're going to notice this from five to seven minutes. And this is where on the project, if you kind of beat your chest and said, I know what I'm doing, but you're in the demo, you should definitely be aware that portals caches that, but it caches it on the repeat. So if you haven't yet went to the page that asks for it, we don't log in and like pre-cache all the data. That would be very expensive and a lot of for us to keep in memory. The caches, by the way, in memory, we don't store it to disk. So when the user logs in, if you're building something, until the user gets to the page or your code that reads that data, we don't store that query, right? But when we do, you kind of poison your cache for a bit, right? It's staying there uh, and it's cached. The exception to this is, hey, Nikita, this is kind of annoying, right? So if I create a case, I go to the list of cases and then go back and create another case, like, Am I missing a case? No, you're not, because anytime you actually touch that table, not only you as a user, all of that cache is expired, 
and all of its children items as well, cache is expired. Um, it actually expires cache for any other user on the site. So on very busy sites, you probably don't notice this and you use, end users won't notice this. The only time people notice that there is um, not real time data or they're seeing a data that's been cached is a byproduct of some design use cases. And we'll show you a couple of them. It is, I'm on the phone with support. I'm looking at the portal and I said, please close my case or I don't know, clear my fine or show me that I'm paid. And they're like, done. And then you hit refresh and you're like, well, it still shows that I didn't pay. And that becomes a training issue. You just tell the custom support person that, you know, we still live in 2000s and uh, the, the, the data is five minutes behind, right? Not a great answer, but it's a better one than asking, hey, Nikita from Microsoft, can I turn off cash? Which the answer is no. Uh, no, you can't. It's made an integral part of our pages. And uh, if you haven't hit it, it's just because your use case and how you've built the site hasn't hit it. If you're a consultant delivering this for your customers, you should be definitely aware of this and uh, be able to articulate that. So what's in the cache? In the cache, and it's repeat read query cache, right? Uh, that's kind of my own name for it. And I think it makes, makes sense, especially if you're a technical person. Uh, if you're not, what it really means is we're gonna store the table, the parameters and the user. We also do this for anonymous, but anonymous, everybody's the same user, right? Because there's there's no way to differentiate, and the data and the time step. So, if we see a query from let's say uh, a list, list component has the same query for time. It's going to give you page one with no filters of that view uh, up to whatever the paging data that you set. So that's what you're going to get. You're going to get that data. Um, configuration cache uh, uh, that one is scheduled. So if you're making those code changes, right? You might be like, hey, why am I uh, why am I seeing stale uh, data like right and banging my head? Um, that's separate. But the data cache is done per user. So this is why it's so important when you're also in in the project. And let's say you change data, you're going to go and uh, you wanted to see the list of uh, latest machine orders, right? And uh, if you make updates on it, it's going to be real time. Right. It's real time in in the system, right? So if I change this to I don't know, five 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 five, right? The data right now is twenty five. If I change this, this is real time. If I go to views, data again, see five five five. Now if I take this five 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 and make it eight eight eight, tab out of it, right? It's saved here. When I refresh this machine list orders, it's very unlikely that we'll see the latest data, right? Kind of tricking me today, um, just demo gods, but it's unlikely that you'll see real data. Because Dataverse isn't calling an event. We actually had that in the previous version of portals and it just got bad and it didn't work well. Uh, but right now, if I change it to nine, come on, um, it's gonna be messing with me, but it definitely wouldn't expire the cache. Maybe in the dev experience, something is toggling it, but uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be um, that way. So what you need to do for that is be aware that this is happening, right? So the scenario and the challenges that you could run into this is that the fact that if you have, you know, updates that the user makes, the user on the portal does not immediately see those changes, right? That's support use case, right? I'm on the phone, you mark me as paid, still says I'm paid on the website, what's up with that? Just know that that's happening. So, if you have asynchronous activities, and this is a lot of us are using Power Automate today, and you run this code, one of the challenges you need to be aware of is definitely to make sure that uh, you're aware that uh, that's happening. So if you create a case and you have a compute column that's like, I don't know, case type, or you know, it's a submitted and it needs to be in processed or something like that, right? And you want to update that, and you're kind of banging your head against the wall and saying, "Hey, I'm showing the data in Dataverse, but it's not updating on the portal." Um, you need to be aware that why that's happening, which you you just learned, and that uh, you need to just consider that uh, that's going to be the reality for you. So what do you do? Do you convert all of your experiences to synchronous ones? Not always. It's not always a good idea for performance reasons or uh, other reasons. So uh, there really kind of isn't a, uh, a workaround because the query is going to be the same. So it kind of feel like stale data to the user. 
um, you know, can you use synchronous classic workflow or synchronous.net plugin uh, inside of the scope of Dataverse activity, right? You could, right? So if we needed to calculate my case, if your business logic is durable enough and you know you need to see it real time um, for the end user, that might be a choice that you make. Uh, it should be a very educated choice. It should be kind of, I would say, an outlier almost scenario um, where you absolutely need to, to do that because what you're doing is you're putting transactional load. So kind of flashing to the topic of performance is because we don't have an intermediate data store, as you write or for the first time read records, any synchronous workflow or plugin will slow down that transaction in Dataverse. Dataverse is built on Azure SQL. Azure SQL has a relational data model and it has uh, con con eventual concurrency limits that we'll have. So we'll have also suspect to table locking. Uh, right, as any transactional system does. So as you get to very large sites and very high performance, you should definitely be aware. Um, and by the way, very high is not hundreds, not even tens of thousands. Very high is hundreds of thousands or even millions of transactions. You should be aware of um, what you're doing in anything synchronous that uh, that is attached to Dataverse uh, for the tables that you're using in the Power Pages website. Uh, because the users will see the impact, feel the impact of that real time. Because if it's a synchronous activity, it doesn't let go of the transaction. So when you hit that create case and it's kind of uh, frozen there for a second, you want to look at your plugins attached to that, right? Um, the reason why this kind of bypasses cache is because if it's a synchronous plugin, it happens before it finishes writing the row to Dataverse. So that way, when you get the data on, let's say, that case type, we're going to get the case type cached version right here. Okay. The other thing too to consider is that on busy websites, you kind of don't notice because there's a lot of people always kind of like you know creating or editing their cases, so they won't see uh, the 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 latency in the data as much, right? Because everybody's case cache. Why is that? Because we don't want to compute like, hey, should Nikita and Victor when they're both logged in. Um, you know, is there a set of rules that make them see the same case? We don't even bother with that. We just expire everybody's cash uh, for that case. So that was a lot very fast. Common FAQ. Is it on the roadmap? No. Uh, not at this time. I asked this question a couple times a year. Hey, do we are we gonna have like some site setting that says, hey, ignore cash at table level? Um, hasn't happened yet. Uh, you know, uh, when it does, I don't even expect to be the first to know sometimes. So hopefully um, one day that might happen. Uh, but right now that's not in the plan. And the, our explanation for it is best, you know, just best practices. Be aware, plan, right, uh, that it's part of your design. So again, right, so you can go back to the recording. Uh, we'll move on to a couple other things. Uh, with security, but just be aware of this, right? That there is the data cache and the configuration cache uh, that are in this system. Now, that data cache and security flowing into back to our presentation are actually all done at the Power Pages data layer. So, the amazing and beautiful thing about Power Pages is that it's got low code, like click to configure stuff. Right, lists and form and the wizard experience with multi-step form, everything you build here, right, goes to this data layer. If you're using Liquid and you're writing fetch XML queries, guess what? Still passes through that data layer. You use Power Pages Web API, the biggest advancement, right, in, in what you can do, because you can build as custom of UI as you want, um, uh, many cases without a companion application. That goes through that. So when you define your web roles and table permissions, when the user logs in, it's the real time users computed web roles and the com compounded table permissions that take effect. So our data layer, when you're going to say get list of my accounts, right, or my machine orders, it's going to go to the data layer with your query. Then it's going to say, great, who's the user? Get all their web roles, get all their table permissions, right, and then Ask the data query saying, hey, do I have that uh, stored? No, great, go get it from Dataverse. And then it comes back. So if you ever thought that you can cheat the data security with liquid code, you can't. Uh, same thing with the web API. So one of the so something to keep in mind is that if you made poor choices, 
This is where I give you an anecdote of security. And there's no slide for it, so I'm just going to pause and tell you this. We've done a solution review for an industrial customer, big brand name. And they had uh, two projects, and they were done kind of in a similar way. Two completely different partner teams helped them build it. And in one, you get a link to finish your customer profile. And these were B2B sites, um, thankfully, right? And you get a link, so you sign in, you get a link, and you open the record, and you get there. Um, be very careful with your web roles and table permissions. They build code in Liquid, right? So when you get to the list, you get the special link. The link contains the ID of the account that you need to finish setting up. I'm like, hey, on the surface, doesn't sound bad. When we did their code review and solution review, we looked at web roles and there was just one web role. I said, well, how do you match your contacts to the people who are signed in? And they're like, what are you talking about? In their code in Liquid, they literally had a fetch XML query that said, took the ID of the account, read it, then looked at the email address of the logged in user and said, is my email address the same? That's fantastic. As long as your entire UI here is just the read output. <laughs> so they had the read output. So basically, if you start guessing the goods, which right now with CISOs on their toes every day, or you getting a security scan or something, and hopefully if you're doing a security scan on a large customer site or you're doing security analysis, your security team is asking you about your authorization strategy, like how are people authorized, what records are they able to use, and they'll try to break the system. So they'll log in with user A, and then log in with user B, and then they'll trade URLs. Right? It's kind of also mimicking man in the middle attacks. So what was definitely happening is very quickly, you can literally take their invite emails that they're sending and say, I can just sit here guessing goods and I can get into another customer's onboarding process. Yikes. So that's also not good. They're like, no, 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 you care. I have code here in Liquid that checks if the logged in user's email address matches that account. I'm like, okay, that doesn't sound bad, does it? Well, when you get to the edit screen, Liquid can't do an edit screen. So they said, no, 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 I have code on the edit screen that says, you know, checks that again. And because Liquid runs server side, I'll render the edits form, or I have an else block that tells them, hey, you're on the wrong account, or just tells them error. That's fine because you're doing that security check in server side code in Liquid, perfectly fine. The challenge is if you had another form anywhere else that had a look up to that account table, you would see all accounts suddenly. So they'll, I mean, at that point in the project, they'll probably have to go back and figure out what they were doing, but they had a web role that basically set global. So the first sniff test for any security review is if you go to web roles on the project and you have a bunch of global, 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 you better be able to explain why you have the full table open to the user. Here's an even more dangerous one. On that same project, they had a bunch of custom UI, like their custom edit form. The custom edit form, was using Web API. Absolutely fine. Nothing wrong with there. Their problem all along was that they didn't actually scope the contacts relationship to an account durably in the, the real way. They kind of did it haphazardly with poor code, which probably was okay if they're always doing the server side. But Power Pages Web API runs on the front end. So now you actually had an experience where you could go and because Power Pages Web API is open, you can go read all the accounts right there. So if a baddie or during the security review, I log in and I like view my network trace and I'm like, oh, cool, look, they got some web APIs. And I try to get data, you technically can go and get data. So what, what do you need to do? You need to make sure that you really think through the invitation strategy for your sites and make sure that you actually think deeply about Nikita is a contact. He belongs to Microsoft as an account and I have machine orders. And if you kind of can't quickly come up with how I make that linkage, uh, please follow my Power Pages in the Day Lab <laughs> that Donna and Nikita built. And because we actually built this on purpose to teach you that you should really start your table permissions right, with either an account or a contact scope when you think about anything security related. Because if you had global and you write a bunch of cool magic or you invent your own security, very likely where you're inventing your security is probably liquid. Or you're thinking or you're new to development and you're doing it in JavaScript, 
a bad actor like Nikita can come into your site and probably steal or update records they can't. So the biggest liability on that site that I reviewed is that somebody can sit there guessing GUIDs on the invite thing, which will prevent them from going here. They can go to the edit of their project status, but because they had all the project statuses open, they were doing the queries all in the UI. I can just start messing with the queries here and get other like onboarding steps or something else done there. So always think, defensively on your security, always take the time to plan the table permissions correctly uh, so, so that you can actually get to, you know, the only machine orders I should see are the ones linked to the account that I belong to as a contact, and those are the ones I'll be able to see. That way, no matter how you've accessed your data, your web API, through Liquid, or through the native experiences, you'll always get that. You'll never get to, to go to a form and then suddenly click on the account lookup and then see all the accounts, which is usually pretty bad. Um, and in some companies, they're actually required to report it and pay fines to the government. Other ones are required to then, what I mean by reporting is send a letter to all their customers says, I'm sorry, I probably exposed your data. Um, nothing good ever happens to the project teams when they are part of that. So I'll leave you with that because I'm way behind on like reading chat. Um, I'll hang out a little bit more after this to, to catch up on this. S performance. So I know cache is annoying. Repeat read cache is annoying to deal with, but you just need to understand that that's part of our architecture. If you're demoing a site or you're a developer and you're working on a site and it's slow, and by slow, I mean like a good page is three to five seconds, right? Full total load time. All right, let's go to the network tab, clear the results, right? How long is this page? Homepage is not really a great one. In this use case, let's look at like machine orders. If it's slow for you in dev, it will not be faster in prod. We're not in early cloud days where you're sitting on some kind of like really bad infrastructure. Look at this, sub-second page performance um, at about three seconds here about four seconds here for this page, right? Um, this data is now cached, so it should be almost even, even faster, right? I'm not loading the list of data here. Look at this, half a second page load time. Now, getting to under two seconds total page load time will take some work in most projects, but the thing is, <laughs> please, if it's slow now, find out what you did. Whether it's you know uh, maybe too convoluted of a set of web roles and table permissions. If you're writing custom logic, you know what will hold this page from taking longer to load is liquid code in it. So some kind of a logic. I'll tell you one anecdote before we run out of time. We were reviewing a project, and their load time for the home page was like five to ten seconds, and then sometimes it'd be like 20, 30. Unacceptable. New customer, they're going live with Power Pages. They're like, Nikita, the IT team is going to be the first customer. Everybody's going to laugh at this. What's wrong? We had to go look at their code. They built their own grid. Usually a red flag, but I'm like, okay, why did you build a grid? Um, complicated. I'm like, okay, that's okay. Let, let's look at what you're doing. In the grid, when they were loading this grid, they were checking the email address of the contact. Right. A completely different project team, but maybe they went to the same coding school. Email address, which I'm like, you know, people change their email addresses or, you know, people's names change if they get in here. <laughs> they change the email address of the person with another table where they had an email address for some reason again, then to link to the data. And that doesn't sound terrible if they did it all in one liquid query, right, to return the total records. No, they returned 10,000 records in the first query, and then during the for loop trying to draw the grid, they did this if statement trying to read and compare the email addresses on 10,000 rows. So of course that page took a long time. I'm actually surprised it was actually that performant. And all of that was happening in the initial page load time. So think about your liquid statements. Everything you write in liquid from the home page down to the footer and everything in the middle, if you have includes, gets executed server time. And then the page leaves the server. Not hating on Liquid, but you should start to use Web API because the grid here came by a little later. There's actually somewhere right here, not client telemetry. There should be uh, where we're going and getting the grid data. Somewhere here. Come on. Not client 
Why telemetry? Come on. Anyways, somewhere here, there is a web call that gets the data. So do it in the AJAX manner, right? So if you're writing custom UI, probably should start getting away from Liquid. Liquid still has its place because it's server side. So you could do soft security with it. Like, hey, uh, because table permissions doesn't have a work clause, right? Sometimes you need to show a read-only form for a user uh, when, let's say, the case is closed versus when case is not closed. Right, you can show them the edit version of that form. Again, you doing that swap is an if statement in Liquid server side. But the more logic you do server side holds back the page execution. Everything else, try to use Web API. The other problem I see in Web API security wise is when you go to site settings and I look at your Web API settings, I'll notice that you'll have a Web API set up and then you're going to give it all columns. Again, you probably don't know what that means in the development. This is the same reason probably the same team did uh, global. All right. So if you type in, um, if I have Web API here, um, there we go. If you have this, that's bad. You should specifically specify which fields. Because remember, Web API is in the UI layer. You might have columns that you don't want the users to update. When you build forms, you gave the user the columns you wanted them to view, right? When you build them the view, you don't want a column that's like, you know, customer class, right? Or uh, rating or whatever it is, right? To be a field. So as you selected views and forms using your native controls, you gave the fields. Now in the UI, you're like, Nikita, well, I've built them the fields. Good. Then finish up and provide the list of fields here. Same thing when you run fetch XML queries. Well, I'll turn to questions because we're out of time, but don't throw away your development best practices, or if you're new to development, learn core coding best practices, which is, you know, for a query, only get the records you need. Don't get the whole table and filter it after. So build a deeper, better query. Grab only the fields you need. By the way, image and file columns, don't get the don't get that field, get its URL, right? get the fields you need because not only it, the query becomes slower also you might be getting columns you might not need and if your table is enabled for web api it's important that you uh, specify the columns you want there is something important um, for power pages web api power pages web api column permissions you could get specific so take a look and look at that. This is designed for you to be able to um, provide a specific set of columns. And it's really good examples of what you're able to do. So you can get various permutations mimicking what your um, uh, form and views allowed you to do. So you can make sure you don't overexpose data uh, that you're not, didn't intend to. So I threw a kitchen sink at you today uh, with a bunch of things. Let me actually see if maybe Victor can help me highlight some of the questions. And uh, I'll, uh, I got time to hang out a little bit. We probably could have used more time or less content. Yeah, uh, I, we don't have a whole lot. I think you covered the one on ALM. I do have a question though uh, mm -hmm. for you, if I may um, use that to pick up your yeah. brain a little bit. Um, I had trouble before um, enhanced data model reading, um, file content from the the from a notes uh from the notes table mm -hmm. it would not read the whole data if i did it as a fetch xml query okay so i had to resort to the uh to liquids uh entities uh object to get the data from mm -hmm. there so and and hearing you talk about performance here you know uh especially in regards to fetching data uh what would be the best approach in reading data? For example, you have to build a table experience. You don't want to use lists. You build your own table. Of course, you're going to limit your um, set of uh, columns or the, the display. You would limit by the set of columns that you have to bring from the database. But then you go from there to another page. And usually the way we do it is we, we get the ID and then we look for the data all over again on the next page, right? Uh, 
what is your advice? Should we be leaning towards uh, using the entities object more than doing another fetch? Because I mean, I mean, it's it's there in a in a cache, right? We don't have to run another fetch, yeah. or how, how does that yeah, work? Yeah, the liquid any... entity object is the same. It 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 query folds a little differently. Um, I don't know if it's better. I would almost assume writing your own fetch will always be more precise and exact. Like you're getting just the columns you need. Um, you know, when we get to really high end things, like you want to almost go back to like your dynamics performance school, if there ever was one. There were used to be some great articles on it, mm -hmm. but like. If you expect one row to come back and you're searching on a big table, don't do sort, set top, right? Do no lock hints. All those things apply when you're doing it from Power Pages when you get to that. In the nice. web API for the retrieve, you could actually, there is a method to pass the fetch XML query um, to the web API instead of using the, uh, the OD the nomenclature. Uh, so if you needed to get it, um, how you store the pages configuration shouldn't change how your data security retrieval works. So um, I wouldn't mm -hmm. confluence the two. So um, I have heard that there are you know, a couple, and I've ran into them, a um, couple of bugs in, like, in the portal management app with enhanced data model, right? So, I mean, you see something weird, please report it to support. Like, you know, I've seen people show me like workarounds of things that they've done, and I'm like, how long has this been going on? They're like seven months. I'm like seven months? We could have <laughs> could have fixed this six months ago. Please go report it to support. Support's job is to, um, uh, other than just it's, it's it is sometimes painful to work. Their job is to basically find where the problem is. Is the problem in your code? Are you the only customer that's having it? Can they reproduce it? Can you reproduce it? Because they need to tell the developers what to fix, and then they file a bug that goes to engineering or if it was an infrastructure hiccup, right? So two out of the three problem areas could be us. So the support's job is as quickly as possible. This is why they ask you to you know, record the HAR file because they're trying to reproduce and replicate this themselves. So if you have a common mm -hmm. thing that you can reproduce, and in fact, you're going as far as building workarounds for, please go to support and say, hey, I'm expecting it to work in the, power, in the fetch query, I'm not able to get it to deserialize properly or whatever it is, but it shouldn't be related to how the config is stored here. The mm -hmm. bugs that I've seen with enhanced data model are like, hey, I'm in the pages management app and I'm like configuring some metadata and it didn't work. I think that one got fixed, right? Or something else is happening somewhere else. Um, there was actually a hiccup in content, the pages studio saving the content, right? That there's a little bit of a bug there that got fixed. So there are some emergency patches like this being a studio, we can patch that real time, okay. right? Patches that come in the runtime, those come monthly, right? So mm -hmm. the version of your site, in fact, your dynamic site you've built eight years ago, and my Power Pages site that I can start today will run on the exact same version, but the exact same infrastructure and software. I so see. do I need to upgrade my dynamics website? No. You have budget to rebuild your site? Yeah, have fun. Uh, but you don't need to upgrade anything, right? Um, so that's kind of let's say that uh, maybe unclear, it's not like a dirty secret, it's just like people are like, do I need to migrate to Power Pages? Um, no, your config is still here. You should probably migrate to Enhanced Data Model and mm -hmm. migrate to Bootstrap. Bootstrap is class names in your site. That's gonna take some touch up and testing. And the Enhanced Data Model, unless you made relationships to ADX tables, read more in our documentation, um, you'll be fine, but you should probably migrate plan both of those migrations at the same time. Yep. While you do that, might as well revisit what you used to do with Liquid. Um, check your performance, check your columns, check your work laws, right? Like just make sure you're using best practices uh, for great performance there. Uh, and where possible, move to asynchronous methods, All right? So in performance, what that customer said, hey, what can I do to make it even faster, right? So we took that 10 second page, built contact, to account to that record, trying to be really mm -hmm. careful not to overexpose the use case on the customer, and use table security, remove their code checking email addresses inside of a for loop. First of all, they should have used paging, right? So if you write the query, a lot of it, I think, becomes not people, they don't intentionally want to build poor stuff, is that they don't test with realistic data. They don't ask what the, like, eventually what the table size is. A solution architect on the project should talk about archival eventually of that table. Mm -hmm. As things get longer and bigger, the operational data store will have to 
the queries take longer, right? Um, so if you don't build like top, if you expect one row, like put that in. If um, you're building a grid of widgets, well, ask yourself like if you're building your own custom grid of it, like what are the maximum rows? Like, am I getting how many? How will I page? Uh, and there's different ways to to do it um, uh, between that. So you can modernize those things uh, between your site. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, I agree. Uh, uh, I think as as Power Page user uh, uses usage, sorry, grows. Uh, I hope for a day where we can on the track configuration we can say. Uh, I want to track it in Power Pages, so that way it's more granular as to what we are bringing to the cache uh, for Power Pages. But maybe a discussion for for another time. But yeah, we we do have a comment here uh, mm -hmm. about talk uh, talking about licensing. I I don't know if you want to go down. I can, be, I, can be, I can be really really simple. All of your yeah. non prod environments can be developer plans. In a developer plan environment, what you can't do. Right, because your site runs, site's configuration is stored in Dataverse. When your trial expires, you just do a new one. Um, if you're in an organization or a tenant where you don't have the rights to create a thing, now you're bothering an admin once a month. And then you're also like screaming at them because you can't preview what you're building without a site running. So that becomes a problem. So in large organizations that say don't run on trials, use developer plan. Right? Developer plan allows you to have your site running. What you can't do in a developer or a trial plan is make the site public, set up a custom domain for obvious reasons, because you set a custom domain, make the site you know, uh, non-private, you're basically running it live. Uh, the problem for that for us is uh, um, uh, spammers could go create sites, right? like too many sites, without paying at least or swiping somebody's credit card. Right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a different problem to solve. So you could run on dev sites. Um, a user in a tenant can have up to three dev plan sites, right? So technically everybody else should have a minimum of a licensing pack of either authenticated or unauthenticated users. If you're on a project with both, technically you're supposed to have one of each per site, right? Assigned to it, right? Um, so look in the licensing guide there. So you do, if you're saying, hey, I have a site for 12 users, Nikita. Yeah, you're buying, and they're logging in. You're buying a hundred, you can't buy less. Um, mm -hmm. and technically, if you they don't don't use the dev plan, you also need to buy two more to accommodate for the dev and the QA site, uh, and you should be assigning them. Uh, so you'll start to get alerts when you're under licensed. The good news is the site is not shut down. When 101st user logs in, we don't tell them sorry, right? Um, I think ADX licensing used to like flash that like the license expired but you would refresh the page you'll go back to the site uh we, we don't do anything like that because last thing we want is for you to have a bad brand rep right with whatever you built on your site so we'll let you run the problem is you're not going to get more azure websites so if you went live with a site that has 100 users and that's all you license is one pack and you now have 10,000 users you're still we're still only going to give you that one azure web app that you're running on you buy the licenses for 10,000 users. We're going to give you more Azure web apps to grow horizontally. What it, that also doesn't mean is, hey, if your site is slow, do I need to buy 10,000 users just to get slow, Nikita? No, whatever you did that caused bad performance is not going to change by us giving, by us giving you more servers. Because mm -hmm. we're not going to have more servers running that one user experience. That's why I said, if it's slow in dev, you're going to be even slower in prod with more users and more data. So whatever you're building now, if something is weird, and I don't mean by like when you clear cache and you're like, Nikita, this was an eight second page. Um, no, like browse it again, sign in and out, tell people to like get out of the studio for a minute, right? So you can demo this experience. If you're in that three to five second range total load time, yeah. Um, had another customer, they had a big loading screen, like they wrote their own that blocked the user from accessing it. <laughs> again. Like, don't fight the users. Like, users are used to things loading on the screen, right? Like, don't block the user from engaging with it. Same thing with Liquid, right? If you wrote the Liquid code, some complex code to render this list of pages and you did it in Liquid, this whole page would just be blank because it's sitting for that response. To the user, the page didn't, didn't begin till now. 
So mm -hmm. even though the total load time is a little less, they can maybe begin engaging with this page earlier. So you'd want to maybe consider like write more Ajaxy reactive asynchronous behaviors. So if you're building your own custom form, right, don't build the read in liquid, build it in web API, even getting the data. Right. And then as an update, you'll send the data. That way the page loads quicker, the perceived performance is faster to the user. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it's slow and lagging or whatever is happening in your use case, um, and it's just you <laughs> and maybe another person in that system and probably, you know, too little sample data, um, you gotta look into it. But yeah, I would say don't start panicking and calling support. Support's going to have a tough time um, until you can point support to where you think the performance problem is. Mm -hmm. Just loosely saying, hey, the site doesn't perform well, you're going to have a terrible experience. Just going to be honest with you, because they're going to be like, well, where? Why? Did it? Are you live licensed and everything's fine and it started to get slow? Again, with them, that's a smoking gun because you're like, I didn't change code. <laughs> now you better be like, you know, looking at our former grid and you're like, hey, something happened this month because we only update it once, once a month with this grid code and now it runs slower. And usually what we find is, oh yeah, well, yeah, we added a retrieve plugin on machine orders. Well, how long does it take? They'll have the telemetry and they'll tell you like, oh, there's three seconds being added by some code in the plugin that goes and does a seek in machine order line items and resums it every time live. Oh, that's that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. Uh, do an asynchronous count and update that column or something like that, right? So they'll find it. Be very specific with support with what performance you want to have. Give them the background. And then also, I mean, if somebody's in the background right now, like if I'm on this edit form and somebody else is in this environment and like, you know, resets cache or does publish all, like you're going to have a terrible experience. So you, you want to get specific and be able to reproduce what the problem is. Then support can be helpful. They're like, hey, on this page, they'll still ask you to like view source. They'll still ask you to go to the network trace and then do this like export hard file because they want to see what's happening. And they'll see, oh, half a second page load time. That's not bad. But then whatever else is happening here is slow. So they'll ask you to, okay, let's, they'll look into um, that retrieval, right? There we go, finally found it, right? So here's the line that gives you the code that gets us the data to draw this. And it was an asynchronous call. They're gonna say, okay, how long did this take? Oh, that's not that bad. Mm -hmm. 160 milliseconds, that's 0.1 second. And that's why it's beautiful when it's refresh cache, right? There's a lot happening here, but that was pretty good, right? Yeah. Back here I again. Can't... I think Sunil has a question. Uh, Sunil, I see your hand up. Yeah. Hello. Hey, Nikita. Hi, Victor. Hey, how are you? Hey. This is Sunil Kumar, this side. And I have one quick question coming back to the licensing. I mm -hmm. OK. I'm sorted when a developer needs a specific set of licenses, maybe Power Apps Premium, Power Apps Per App, to develop any of the site web page, uh, website, uh, basically so that they can have all the rights available to them. I'm sorted mm -hmm. from the consumption point of view also that whether it has to be an authenticated or anonymous, we are going to purchase those specific set of licenses or packages. Now, my confusion arises when an internal user who has Power Apps Per App or Power Apps Premium has to use the site as well as a user. Does that, uh, so, so basically, would they be counted as an authenticated user also? or not so one one thing to keep in mind for that use case that's uh that's very specific is they have to sign in mm -hmm. so here's what i see many times you'll have an internal site you know like nikita this is an internal site forget mm -hmm. about private which is the op like, like right like but, internal site will never be private is dev mode mm -hmm. Just ignore the naming private means project team mode by the way when the site is private it doesn't consume licensing Right. So good for dev sites. For intranet sites, when intranet users are signed in, the key is signed in. So what you want to make sure you do on your uh, authenticated only site, like see this intranet site, 
I'm going to show you mm -hmm. my configuration for it. If you have an internal site and the home page is unauthenticated, you will technically consume some usage of it because you might have a subdomain and something like that. Um, so see how on this site, the home page has a lock icon. That means it's protected. Like you have to sign it. By the way, rename and don't use administrator's web role. It's a legacy mm -hmm. leftover. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't do anything unique anymore. Mm -hmm. right. So just forget it's there. Won't get into history why it's here, but just don't even bother with it. Go and delete it. Um, so take the home page, make that. Go to setup. Go, oh, sorry. Go to security now. In security, go to identity providers. Turn off local sign-in. So it's just like this. Mm -hmm. And then set as default. And you'll get that little tiny checkbox right here. Now I made this site intranet. I locked the home page, turned off local sign-in, set Azure Active Directory as the default. Now I have an intranet site. What that means mm -hmm. is everybody who's authenticating through Azure AD on sign-in will check if they have a Power App Premium or a mm -hmm. Dynamics license. If they do, the whole licensing thing is skipped. So in this particular case, no package will be uh, consumed? Yes. In fact, when you go to download your, um, if you go to Power Platform, right, when you go to capacity and you'll pick mm -hmm. an environment, you'll go to download reports <clears throat> and you'll get generate a report for our pages, authenticated users, that report will be missing those users. They're like, Nikita, how do I know usage? Usage is separate, mm -hmm. right? Um, analytics. Go to resources, go to pages, sites, and you'll see analytics, which is why you see all that extra, right? And then you can go to your site and then see usage here, right? So usage is not licensing, right? If you want to see how much capacity you've consumed, Correct. usage is you not want to, licensing. Yeah, you want to go back to licenses, right? So we go to Power Pages, and now I can see my per environment kind of licensing here. Yours will look better. This is kind of a hybrid environment. It's kind of like not. Understood, understood. So basically, uh, if we set the Azure AD as the login method, authenticated method, then uh, only the Power Apps Premium or Power, Power App license will get kicked in from the authentication, for the authentication yep. purposes, not the package. Now, if the user doesn't have a license, we don't do auto assign, and um, you will accrue authenticated user license count. Uh, right now, unless you're doing Azure Paygo, there is no billing, so we don't. Until, you know, at your renewal, or whatever, uh, you kind of don't owe us for the month back. You should you always buy it forward. Um, at some point, pretty soon, we'll you'll start to get emails. I think right now that's happening. If you have sites that are under licensed. Um, okay, yeah. one last question. Sorry to take more time yeah. than expected. I do not want to hold you here. The one last question is related to the ALM. Anytime are we seeing any release plans from Microsoft that the Power Platform pipelines could be used? They can be today. I, I literally worked on a volunteer project last week. We okay. didn't have needs for deployment profiles or anything complicated. Why you'd mm -hmm. want a deployment profile. So we'll have environment variables in Liquid. So you could do your app insights GUID. You can do a different uh, Power BI report GUID between dev and prod, which you should, right? Um, if you don't need those needs right now, you can go to pipelines and literally take the solution and say, move to prod. And it does. I've so used it last week, as is copy from dev to prod, you know, a very simplified use case, you can do that. So you can use our pages inside of solutions and use Power Pipelines with it today. Just the caveat is we don't have environment variables, which means mm -hmm. if you need to have differences between prod and dev in code, you couldn't accomplish that today. And the if you unpack the site, the, the source code is kind of, kind of, kind of nasty. All right, this is this is awesome, Nikita. Somebody suggested a show, a weekly show. <laughs> where you come and just answer all of our questions. We'll call it get on the same page with Nikita. 
yeah, Holy Sick Cage. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to steal that. So, uh, you know, Victor definitely love to, uh, you know, continue to be part of future iterations of Zero to Hero. Uh, you know, if we can do, you know, I don't know, bi-weekly community calls or EMAs at some point, um, awesome. be interested in uh, participating. Uh, I think the things we didn't get to talk about today, and they were kind of like just me smashing way too many topics into one, um, would have been, um, you know, Power Pages login page isn't the real page. But if you bing for it, one of the first hits that you're going to get is a beautiful article from Ulrich that defines the content snippets and the web templates and how to do that. You don't have to do what she's doing here with like the full rewrite of it. But if you needed to put friendlier labels on your login page, yes, you can. And um, the studio team is aware that people want to customize like this, right? See how I made it nice. Your says sign in with external identity providers. What is an external identity provider? Your users don't know. Local, local to who? Um, again, don't use local to begin with, uh, only for testing, right? So customizing this, there is a page copy here, so you can actually write something nice in here. Ulrich goes into those details. In fact, that's actually how she's able to add JavaScript and do even more cool things on it. So beautiful article here. All you need to do is power pages, customize login. What about profile page, Nikita? Same thing. Power pages, customized profile page, beautiful blog by another, right? That's what, what I like that there's so many um, articles. Talks about how to turn off things on the profile page. You can actually skip the profile page after you sign in. So many more tips. We actually hope to get that one in the documentation, login and profile page. I'll work on that uh, this summer. So, but you can customize this text. You can customize the options here. You don't even have to use this as the profile page because uh, you don't. This there's a site setting to turn this off, and there's a site setting for you to not have to stop at this page after sign in because maybe that's not what you want anyways. Uh, forcing the user to do it to control the fields here. There's a web profile form on the contact table, so you go to the contact, find that table, customize it. Again, um, the blog article here. Uh, define it. So just type in power pages, profile page customization. You'll be able to find some resources for that. So we hope that, uh, you know, see how the contact table is not part of it. If you go to the contact table, go to forms. There's a form here for profile web form. There's a new one, uh, profile web form. There's a new one for enhanced data model. You go and edit this form. You get to control the fields visibility and just like you would rip out any fields you want or don't want the users to access because maybe you use an identity provider and your claims map their first name and email address well mark it as read only save and publish hit preview and now nikita can't change his email address so that's it for the show um i think we'll we'll end here Awesome. Nikita, I, I do have one comment uh, uh, only. Uh, has nothing to do with the presentation itself, but since we have your ears and uh, most likely your voice going back to Microsoft, um, one suggestion um, I made in one of these calls was uh, if you go back to the pages designer, please, or workspace rather, mm -hmm. In here, if you were to highlight to a particular area of the page, you can extend uh, by creating a, a different component, right? Uh, and we see here text, video, button, iframe, so on and so forth. Uh, suggestion I was going to make, or I made in one of the calls was, why not bring some of the bootstrap unbound components here as well? Tabs, cards, so on and so forth. We have that. In page uh, in in Power Apps, Canvas App Studio allows you to create to add components that are unbound. Um, why not do it here? Um, as a as a coder, I can go into the Bootstrap website or even use Copilot um, for VS Code Dev or GitHub Copilot to write those for me. But for from a maker experience. I don't think they can do much to that extent. They are pretty much stuck with buttons and sections and content, but not any of the well-formatted um, bootstrap 
uh, components that are available and it wouldn't really take much effort to just add those. Uh, just just my opinion. Any any thoughts there? I know you are coder. You don't really bother yeah, too much about they don't, it. They don't let me code the product. So um, um, I spend most of my day talking to customers answering questions and uh, uh, when they get to uh, take those learnings and, and publish them. So that's going to be a big focus for us. Um, now I hear you. It's a you know more and more uh, components being visible in the studio um, and 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 there. So uh, I can't commit to roadmap items because <laughs> I don't, <laughs> technically don't own any product. But uh, I have it heard is. other asks of saying, "Hey, I'd love to do more in the studio." Uh, I think the team is aware of that. Um, we're awesome. continuing to invest in the low code studio experience but also the pro code studio experience. I'll leave you with the last one on the power pages actions all the way in the bottom. Now there's preview mm -hmm. site. So now yeah, as I make that change, easy. right? That root perfection. And I want to make three explanation marks, hit save and I hit preview site. Now this one is still going to try to open the new site page for me, which I'm like, ah, I don't want it. Right. Um, but the change is, is now published. So at least it's able to uh, expire the config cache. Right, like, like cancel. So I don't yeah. need to, right? Now we got that's the awesome. Finish. That's awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, Nikita. Thanks for your time. Uh, and, and the content that you shared here today, it's like invaluable. It's, it's awesome. Thank you so much. Folks, we'll post this lesson again online later on if you want to revise on demand and pause and take take your time to interpret everything that Nikita is talking about. So it's going to be available for you offline. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining today, Nikita. We we got to do some other sessions. There is, there is much, <laughs> much wisdom there to be shared. So thank you, my friend, and we'll see you soon. Awesome. Look forward to the next round. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.